So good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, please introduce yourself in the chat because we're not gonna go around and have everyone do so, although the legislators will. Um, and we're gonna be launched this morning by First Select Women Tooker from Westport. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Margaret. Happy New Year to all of you. Lots of familiar faces on the uh, Zoom screen today. Um, I think I get the honor of kicking this off because if we were in person, we would be at the Westport Library, I believe. So uh, I just wanna say thank you very much to the legislators uh, who are with us this morning to, um, you know, to give us some of your time. We really appreciate it. I think this is going to be a, um, a wonderful session where members of the Prevention Coalition of both Norwalk and Westport can give you some great feedback from our communities on the current legislation the thoughts that we have regarding the current legislation and potentially some changes that could be made going forward. Um, I do wanna take the opportunity as well to give a shout out to Kevin Dodburn and Margaret Watt, who at least from uh, the Westport uh, side of things are doing just a yeoman's, yeoman's job to really um, ensure our community is up to speed, is, uh, um, communicated with and is knowledgeable of um, all, all the different issues that we're facing when it comes to um, substance abuse. And I can't thank you enough for your efforts. And I want to make sure that I do that in front of this crowd. Uh, we've worked together for a number of years now, and um, you know how supportive I am of all the work that you do. So thank you. So with that, uh, let's get going. Thanks, Jen. And we're going to hear a little bit from Lamont Daniels on behalf of Mayor Harry Rilling from Norwalk. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for select woman. Greetings. I bring you greetings from the city of Norwalk. Honorable Mayor Rilling in his absence, he definitely sends his regrets. So my, and I serve as the chief of community services for Norwalk, and I'm proud to say that I am a licensed clinical social worker. So my role specifically is just to underscore and amplify what most of us already know, the importance of coalition building. And we know that this work really requires a multi-sector, multi-prong approach. And again, Margaret may do this later on, but I would, would like to draw your attention always to the Norwalk Partnership, where there is a wealth of resources. And in that document, you'll also see the, the, the various stakeholders that you will hear from. Uh, fam families, law, law enforcement, clinical mental health, and there's about 12 important critical sectors that really help us work together as a community. And so um, again, bring you greetings. I wanna thank everyone that's here, our legislators, good morning. And we're looking forward to a robust conversation around the importance of coming together to really look at what the data looks like and how to make sure our community, our young people remain safe and educated and informed. So thank you so much, good morning. So I'll turn it to you, Margaret, to uh, to lead the the legislative introduction. I do have a, a an engagement, so please forgive me. I will have to sign up at nine o'clock to go to a meeting as Marilyn is out for uh, the next couple of days. Thank you. Thank you, Lamont. That was perfect. Um, and uh, yes, what we would like to do, I want to reiterate for those joining us, we're going to have the legislators. We're going to ask you to introduce yourselves next um, but for everyone else we would like you to introduce yourselves in the chat provide as much detail as you want so the legislators know who's here um, and i think that i will kick it off with representative krista mccarthy vehi because she is here today and she is newly the chair of the public health committee um, we definitely have public health concerns around cannabis so kristen if you don't mind please introduce yourself and then why don't you just call on one of your legislative colleagues, and we can take it that way. You guys can can call out the next person you see. Good morning, Margaret, and good morning, everyone. I'm actually on my phone right now, Margaret, so it might be easier for you to call on the next person. Sure, you if got you it. Um, I'm Kristen McCarthy Vahey, and I am so happy to see all of you. Uh, I am a partner with all of you as the previous longtime co-chair of Fairfield Cares Community Coalition and newly appointed to the Public Health Committee of the legislature and new to the committee. So I'm looking forward, I'm uh, familiar with some of the issues that we've been talking about. And as we um, worked on the legislation, 
to legalize cannabis, I was a strong advocate for additional prevention, funding, and resources. <laughs> I know there are some tweaks that we need to talk about, so I look forward to the conversation. And Margaret, thank you and Positive Directions for convening us today. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen. Um, okay, I saw Representative Dominique Johnson uh, is on her phone in the car. Um, Dominique is, if you're able to talk, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Thank you so much, Margaret. I am. I'll switch over a little bit. Hopefully I don't lose audio. And it's great to be with you all this morning. And my new colleague, uh, Representative McCarthy Vahey, very excited about her chair of the committee. I see uh, my colleague from Norwalk, Representative Roberts here too, and so many familiar faces, though you can't see mine working with you all over the past few years in Norwalk uh, in the city. So um, as, as I mentioned, I'm now a uh, uh, transitioned off the council. I'm, I'm proud to have been sworn in uh, last week, feels still like a month ago, with uh, my colleagues and uh, am excited to get to work. I've been assigned to the Education Committee, the Higher Education Employment Advancement Committee, and the Judiciary Committee, where um, perhaps some of these issues may come through, but I certainly want to be uh, a support to you all as you do this important work. And uh, uh, one thing I'm happy to note is the connection between mental health and the work that you do all the time and how integral it is to your work. And that's an issue that absolutely was prominent uh, with the community uh, and has continued to be so. And so I want to be an ally with you all on that and constantly make sure um, I'm learning from you and, and up to speed on what's important to you all. Thank you, everyone. Nice to be with you. Thanks so much, Dominique. Um, I see... Uh... Representative Steinberg, a longtime friend, um, Jonathan from Westport, if you could go ahead and introduce yourself. <laughs> I'm sorry, did you just call on me? Yes. <laughs> Hi, Jonathan. Sorry, I thought this was at the library. So now I'm over at uh, Mrs. London's having a cup of coffee. So uh, excuse <laughs> me for being a little bit behind the times here. Uh, uh, I'm Jonathan Steinberg, state representative from Westport, um, uh, former chair of the Public Health Committee, and I'm so glad that Kristen is taking it over, and obviously very invested in the conversation about legalizing marijuana in Connecticut, and uh, also is very dedicated to the proposition of making sure that some of the tax revenue goes towards education and uh, addiction services. That'll do it for now. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, and Representative Kadeem Roberts, newly elected from Norwalk. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kadeem Roberts, um, former common council member, um, Norwalk born and raised, um, was uh, listed as the youngest African-American in the history of Norwalk to be on a common council. And now we broke history again um, within going to the house, to the state delegation. So I'm um, grateful to be here. Um, this is a very important topic, but most importantly, it's a very important for our, our state, you know, and our, our future of our youth, um, the future of, of, of us as well, you know, but most importantly, just, you know, in order to create a community, a state to live and thrive from one another, these are the important conversations that we have to have. Um, right now, I sit on the education committee. I'm a former educator, of course, so that's the most important thing, you know, for me within the community. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really outside with the kids a lot, uh, do a lot of mentorship, um, and I also sit on housing, which is very important as well. You know, I come from low-income housing, um, and to be, you know, someone that comes from these backgrounds to actually what we call make it to where I need to be to the next level is very important. So the kids mentoring them that come from where I come from and to produce these actual success stories is very, you know, very dear to me. And I also sit on children's. My mom has been a preschool teacher for about 45 years in the city of Norwalk. Um, so that's dear to me as well to see, you know, four decades of kids that, you know, what I went to high school with now she has their kids, you know, so to see that is like not just a chain reaction, but it's like a legacy piece for me. Um, <clears throat> so I'm definitely, Grateful for the work that you guys do. Hartford, do you think? I'm grateful for the work that you guys do. Um, and like we said, this is a very important, you know, conversation about cannabis, how it can affect not just, you know, the city, the state, but most importantly, the youth. Thank you so much for those comments. That's really great. Um, and I see um, 
Oh, before I forget, Representative Lucy Dathan from uh, Norwalk and Wilton was planning to be here today and then had to get called into another meeting, so she sends her regrets. Um, I see uh, Representative Jennifer Leeper here. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm also driving up to the Capitol right now, so I will keep my um, video off, but I just want to thank you so much for uh, convening this meeting, and I know this will be a long time ongoing conversation as how we can continue to improve this legislation and ensure that um, our cannabis rollout is safe for our young people um, and continue to invest in prevention and awareness. Um, I'm serving this term as vice chair on the education committee, which I am very excited about, also on human services and uh, commerce. And so thank you again for having me. I'm looking forward to listening to the rest of the discussion. Thank you. And so many of you are in the car, so just want to let you know we're sending you the slideshow and an info brief afterwards so that you'll get the visuals after the fact if you didn't get them before. <laughs> um, I also see Representative Keat here, and then I don't see any other legislators at the moment, although I think a couple others may join us. So um, Sarah Keat, if you can introduce yourself, and if you do see any of your colleagues here that I've missed, then call on them, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I too am on my cell phone, so I don't, I can't see who else is on the call. Um, I am freshman legislators, le legislator, so um, this is all a bit new to me, but as a former public health professional, I'm a big supporter of the legalization of cannabis um, from a social justice standpoint. Um, but I also believe it's important that we have protections and prevention strategies in place. So I look forward to working with all of you as we move forward with this. Um, I am excited to serve on the Public Health Committee with Representative McCarthy Vahey. Uh, I'm also on the Human Services Committee and I am Vice Chair for the Children's Committee. Fantastic. Um... And I'm just seeing in the chat, Tracy, Representative Tracy Mara from Darien and Norwalk um, is driving and is, I guess, uh, Nicole, did you send her the link or where do we need to send her the link? Yes, I just sent it to her. Okay, thanks. Then Tracy will be joining us. Um, so thank you all for being here today uh, for this topic on cannabis. Um, I think in reference to Sarah's comments, you know, We've, this is our new market, it's legalized. We wanna make sure from a public health perspective that we're protecting um, the public, uh, informing them, informing our consumers, protecting our youth as much as possible so that this law goes into effect as responsibly as possible. Um, Kevin, if, uh, my co-chair Kevin is gonna share his screen. And what we're gonna do now is have different individual speakers kind of present on different topics. Um, if we can show the agenda for a second, you'll see what's going to happen next. So we're going to start off with talking about some public health considerations. You're going to hear from me and Dr. Oshman. Then we'll pause after each topic for questions from our legislators. So you'll hear from individual speakers. Legislators, we want your questions because we want to arm you with the, the um, statistics or data or um, views of your constituents so that you can make your best policy recommendations in office this, this session. Um, so the question part will be from you all and then anyone in the audience from their own perspectives will be able to answer. Giovanna Mozo from The Hub is gonna moderate the Q&A after each section. So we'll start with public health considerations, um, move on to youth prevention co considerations, then law enforcement and then funding. Um, so from a public health perspective, next slide please. Uh, we want to focus a little bit on how potent today's cannabis is, um, why that implies a need for health education, and give you some examples of what we're talking about. Those of you who can see the screen, we just want to start by showing how varied the products today are. We have plant matter that you see in the middle. That's the um, you know, original old school cannabis product that we're all familiar with, uh, and edibles like brownies, lollipops. We also have beverages now. We also have gummies and many other forms. Just showing this picture of gummies because you can see we all are familiar with grabbing a bag of candy and eating all of it. So just bear that in mind. Uh, but one of the things that's been around for about 15 years now is these concentrated forms that we might call cannabis. They fall under the cannabis law. But when I say concentrates, what we mean is that the plant 
matter has been largely removed so that we just really only have the THC. THC is the cannabinoid or chemical from the cannabis plant that gets you high. So the concentrated forms of THC can look like oils in, in, this, um, in this dispenser. They can look like shatter uh, over here, which is a hard form of just concentrated THC. They can look like wax. Um, they can be, well, this is a different form of edible. These are breath mints. And you can put them in what's called a dab pen, which is basically a type of vape and use them that way. So we have a market that involves different forms of cannabis, different strengths of cannabis, different weights of cannabis. Um, and, and the different forms have different effects. So right now, just ask yourself if you know, like how long does the effect of cannabis last when you vape it versus when you consume it? You know, like how, at what point would it be safe to drive after eating a cannabis brownie versus vaping versus, you know, using a blend? This is the kind of information that we're pretty sure most people aren't like fully aware of because this is kind of a new market. Next slide, please. Um, this is a, uh, a box, a graphic from an actual cannabis uh, sales store trying to educate the public a little bit. You know, if you use flour, um, the onset is of the effect is takes 30 seconds and can last up to three hours. If you use edibles, it may take 30 minutes to two hours to take effect, during which, of course, you might continue to eat it. Um, the, the effect lasts in your body for four to 12 hours, during which time maybe you've driven home, right? Um, concentrates may take less than 10 seconds to hit. Um, very, very strong high can last for one to three hours. Uh, part of why we're showcasing this is just so you're really aware of the, the different ways people will be using cannabis, um, different impacts that it can have, uh, and why that matters is the potency, which is the next slide. So this is a graph that we want to show you just because we know that not everyone's aware of how strong the, the products can be today. If you look at the graph part on the left, we're showing you the amount of THC in the, in the plant. So the, each bar has a different color based on the year of the measurement. So the 1970s, we are talking Woodstock weed, right? The original plant was, you know, one to 3% THC. Um, it has been sort of bred, selectively bred, genetically modified over the years to get stronger and stronger. So you can think about, you know, when you were in high school or college, um, when people around you and possibly you were using cannabis, you will see how much stronger it's gotten with each kind of successive generation. This chart goes up to 2019 because in 2019 is when the Surgeon General issued a sort of unusual warning saying this is now clearly risky for the teen brain development. In addition, as I mentioned in 2008, um, was the first time we started looking at the concentrates because they were new on the market. The original concentrates were about 7% THC. By 2019, they were often 76% THC. Now on the market, the national market, you can get products that are essentially pure, like 99% THC. So at that point, no plant, just drug. And um, if you can click, Kevin. Thanks. In Connecticut, we did something smart. We took a harm reduction approach. And when we passed the law, we said, we are going to try to set limits on how strong THC can be. So our plant products are capped at 30% THC and our um, concentrates are capped at 60% THC. One of the policy things we, you know, loopholes we wanna see closed is that the law says, well, the pre-filled vapes are exempted from the THC cap. However, the pre-filled vapes are the most popular form among young adults, also very popular among our youth, our adolescents, who of course are not legally allowed to use weed, but are, or you know, some of them are, and more of them will be, as it gets normalized, because that's what's happened in every other state that legalizes retail marijuana. And so we really ask you to think about why, having, having been at the lead in setting harm reduction limits, why would we exempt the products that are perhaps most dangerous to our youth? Um, if you can click one more time, I 
this last box that just popped up is actually to show you that the research shows that levels of THC above 10% are where you actually start to see larger negative effects than positive. So the effects on like mental health, relaxation, stress management, things like that are felt at levels below 10% THC. So these products that get you higher, faster, longer, stronger um, can be detrimental to people's health. Um, that's why I say that our caps are really only a harm reduction approach. They're not based on science. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Oshman from the, the board president of the Fairfield County Medical Association to talk about some of the medical and mental health risks. So I'm not, I, okay, so here is the next slide, which is cannabis use in association with physical health risks. And I think you really should divide this slide into two components. The blueprint on the left is really for medicinal marijuana, and that's with CBD higher than THC. So the THC is the psychoactive part of marijuana, and there's much, much less of that in medicinal, um, in the medicinal uh, products that people take. Um, and you can see, if you're not like me and, and need glasses and it's just very small. Um, it's used for relieving glaucoma. It's used for muscle spasm. It's used to relieve nausea. And one thing that hasn't been put on the slide is that actually it's good for um, children with epilepsy. And there's an FDA approved drug for that to help relieve them of their seizures. Now on the right hand side, we see all of the effects of THC or the psychoactive part of the medication of the drug. And it's, it's harmful in many ways. It's harm for fetal development. You have uh, small birth rates, small uh, babies due to smoking. It's found in the milk of, of, of women who are breastfeeding. And um, it's effects on um, brain development. In children, especially, it affects adolescent brain development, which was something Margaret had mentioned, and we really need to uh, take that into account. So I'm gonna move on to the next slide. And here, these are the mental and behavioral risks. So um, especially, there are these acute effects that occur when people smoke. There are psychological effects, which include anxiety, dysphoria, which is feeling um, dissatisfied with life, paranoia, agitation, there are psychotic symptoms. In, in fact, in Denmark, they've done a study to show in their population of about 7 million people that in 1975, before cannabis was introduced to the population, 2% of the population was schizophrenic. When it went to 2010, it increased to 8%. So there really is an effect when you introduce this into the population. It's not happening to everyone. It's different uh, between an individual. It's different within an individual, depending on the dose that they take. But um, we should also realize that there are also these cognitive and psychomotor impairments that occur with smoking. There's decreased concentration decreased short-term memory, decreased information processing, decreased reaction time, and increased risk of motor vehicle crashes. So it's very important to realize this, especially if you're thinking of, of uh, smoking and, drive, and driving. And this happens just with cannabis use. You don't have to add anything else to this. You don't have to smoke and have cannabis use. But I will tell you that if you drink with cannabis, if you drink alcohol, it makes everything worse. So you really should not mix things when you're, when you're um, doing recreational cannabis. So there are also these effects on the heart rate, which um, I hadn't mentioned before, but it increases, your blood pressure increases. And now the anesthesiologists are questioning people about their marijuana use before they'll even operate on them. And even for, for small operations that are done in the office, you know, you don't need a major operation. You have epinephrine that's added into syringes for anesthesia and that increases your heart rate. 
And this would just add to that and, and increase your blood pressure. So that's a dangerous thing. And it's interesting in the long-term effects, you can decrease your heart rate and decrease your blood pressure if you use it in long-term. And that can give you uh, a feeling of lightheadedness, dizziness. It's called orthostasis. You know, you, you just don't feel right in standing up. You, it also increases, when you take a long-term effect, your risk of coughing, increased phlegm, wheezing. There are long-term um, neurocognitive deficits that come with marijuana. So I would go to the next slide. And these are just uh, Department of Health statistics. It's a three-year increase in the hospital admissions. And as you can see, it's, it's really jumped. I can tell you that in the state of uh, Colorado, where they've been using this more than we have, their hospital ER admissions have gone up 147% just with the introduction of cannabis. So um, I think we have to be ready for this. We have to be ready at the effects, the, the psychological effects. We have to have uh, money put aside for people who are going to need help with this. And the, the state should take that into consideration, you know, when they're budgeting, you're going to need more psychologists and psychiatrists. We already know that we have a doctor shortage coming to the state and um, a lot more people will be needing help. So if, um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them or we can wait till the end. Let's, if you don't mind, Robin, let's just finish this um, piece out. Uh, but thank you so much for that. And also welcome to Representative Tracy Morrow, who was able to join in the meantime. So Robin just pointed out so many health and mental health um, risks from today's cannabis. The stronger the product and or the more frequently used and or the younger the person starts using, the more you see the mental and behavioral health effects. So if you heard anything just now this morning that you weren't aware of, then think, okay, what about all the people around me who also don't know that and who should? We want an informed consumer base. We also especially want parents to be informed so they can talk um, responsibly uh, to their kids. And um, so a couple of ways that you can do something about this in the legislature are to require certain forms of health information to be out there. What you're seeing on the screen right now is something that Colorado introduced just last year and went into effect January 22. So they legalized marijuana 10 years prior, um, did see a lot of problems um, in terms of education and you know, awareness. And so as of this year, anytime someone purchases a THC concentrate, they get a two page info sheet, such as what you're seeing on the screen so that they have more information. We do this when we pick up prescription drugs, right? Information comes with it. So this is something Connecticut could do. Um, I want you to notice on here, they, they provide um, resource numbers. They have a really key message here, which is start low and go slow. So start with the lowest dose. And you know if you want to increase to a higher strength, um, that's important. Uh, here's what they're suggesting a concentrate serving sizes if you're not inhaling. Uh, next screen, please. Uh, this is the other side of their concentrates information page, and you can see they put health warnings. Use of concentrates can lead to psychotic symptoms, mental health, hyperemesis syndrome, et cetera. They have a couple of key messages around, you know, concentrates are not for inexperienced users, um, not recommended for anyone under age 25 except recommended by a doctor. And they have the labeling requirements, and they also list the penalties um, for you know breaking the the Colorado law. So we think this is a great example. If it took Colorado ten years to decide they needed this and then pass it, we could do this now. Next slide, Margaret. I'm just going to pause you um, right there. Jimmy Izzo um, did have his hand raised in the previous slide, so I'd like him to ask his question. Okay. Because if, if he's like me, I probably forgot it by now. Okay. And this is the, the, this next one is the last slide for this section before the comments anyway. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Thank you, Margaret, for doing this forum and everybody involved here and the legislatures who have attended. I think this is wonderful. I, I think 
you know, my personal views on this, everyone who knows me knows, I think this is a huge mistake throughout the country. Um, doctor, you mentioned something about, you know, long-term health. You know, my mother comes from the generation of smokers in the 60s. And, you know, it sort of started like this, like it's legal, it's good, it, it's okay for you. And I'm looking at her long, the consequences of 50 years of smoking coming out now. Are we setting ourselves up for a huge health crisis down the road after? I mean, I'll be long gone by the time these young kids get there, but is this a long-term problem health-wise? So I think it's um, like anything like we have with alcohol, you know, is that a long-term process? If you use it responsibly, it's not a bad thing. If you're not, if you're smoking a lot, and I think you should remember also Margaret pointed out that when your mother started smoking, there was about uh, five milligrams of THC, which is the psychoactive component of marijuana in a joint. Now there's more like 36 milligrams of THC. So you get higher sooner. It's like it only takes about eight minutes to get high on, on one of these joints. Is it gonna be a problem for a certain part of the population? It will be a problem. Just like alcohol isn't a problem for everyone, there will be a certain part of the population where this is a problem. So we should get ready for it. I mean, we've seen it. I gave uh, some information about Denmark. We see the increase in ER visits. People should be educated. I think they're, they're not as aware as they okay. are with alcohol as the effects that uh, can happen to them and their children. So a lot of this would, would be in educating the public. Mm -hmm. So right. you know, that, that's how I would answer that. Sure, thing. but, but I, I thank you for that. But the thing is, when you're young, you think you're going to live forever. And that's, uh, so we're, <laughs> just, we're, we're just adding another thing to our health crisis, in my opinion. But thank you very much. I appreciate your answer. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Um, let me just um, point out that, you know, we do need all these different forms of health education if we're going to, you know, if we're, if we're in this new market, right? So we just showed warning information that could be distributed with the products, which I think would be really a great idea. Um, in addition, we already have the model that in for alcohol and nicotine, every package you purchase, every bottle you purchase has a health warning label on it. As you can see here, this is a bottle I bought here in Norwalk. Um, according to the Surgeon General, women should not drink alcoholic beverages during pregnancy because of the risk of birth defects. Consumption of alcoholic beverages impairs our ability to drive a car or operate machinery and may cause health problems. Um, Kevin, if you can click. Um, the Connecticut cannabis law does not require any such health warning label on packaging. It only says that you have to list the legal age. So this is an easy um, fix and we have the model from cigarettes, from, from alcohol. We should be listing some of these health issues on our packaging because we know a lot of people aren't aware of this. And if you can click one more time, Kevin, uh, I just want to make sure everyone knows that there is research into the impact of health warning labels. They are effective for substance use prevention. They do educate the public. They actually can lead to change decisions about purchasing. And they are also most effective when they incorporate graphics. So I think introducing warning labels with graphics, some combination of graphics and text on our products would be really important. In Norwalk, I know we've also talked about why can't we have large scale bilingual graphic posters just highlighting the health risks, health and mental health risks that are required at every point of sale so that, you know, you're in there and you're buying, but you just are informed. You see information, you can make an informed decision. Um, so next screen, uh, this is where we want to ask our legislators to we, we would really like the questions to come from legislators. Tell us what you need to know. Tell us if you would be willing to do anything about strengthening potency caps, um, removing the exemption on vapes, mandating health warning labels with graphics, requiring health information on concentrates, and also, um, didn't mention this yet, but really requiring single serve packaging on edibles because Edibles are now sold where um, you can you can buy an edible and you're really supposed to eat like a third of a gummy bear. And that's not realistic. And we already know there's been a huge increase in kids and pets 
um, calling poison control center because they've consumed edibles that look like candies. So these are our questions to you and we would love the legislators now to ask, tell us what they're planning to do or ask what they need to know. Um, and Kevin, do you mind not sharing your screen anymore so we can see each other? Thanks. Representative Roberts has a question. Yes, thank you. Um, so I, once again, I appreciate all this information is very, very uh, important. Um, my question um, is when Margaret did speak about the uh, hospital admissions, um, <laughs> did they state did they state, Margaret, what hospital, like what the admissions were for? Like, was it for, you know, breathing issues, um, high blood pressure? Like, what is the what is the hospital admissions for? And then my other question, is, I mean, not my other question, but um, I do find it very odd that these labels aren't on it, you know, just giving, just being very descriptive of, you know, the do's and the don'ts, you know, and, and we do have that on cigarettes, you know, regardless if people still want to smoke cigarettes, you know, um, it's understandable. But, you know, giving precautions is very important. So I definitely want to stand on that and, you know, put that out there as well um, publicly and say, you know, that's something I definitely, you know, agree with. Kadeem, that would be amazing if you would, uh, you know, go out on that limb and or introduce a bill concept around that. Um, to, to, to the DPH question, uh, some of those bars were just were specifying just underage admissions and, you know, under 18 and over 18 admissions to any Connecticut hospital where cannabis was a presenting problem. Um, but that's the level of the data collection, right, it, uh, at the state level. So we don't have details on exactly what for cannabis. And then the third bar on that particular chart was cannabis emission, um, sorry, hospital admissions where the person presented with psychosis and it was related to cannabis. So that was specifically psychosis. Okay. Thank I, you so much. I could, add, I could add something to that. You know, with these edibles, you have children getting access to these edibles without realizing that they're not candy. So that's one of the importance of labeling and keeping this away from our youth. <laughs> and they're going to be um, admitted. There's also something called cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, where you, if you're a chronic user, and the longer you use it, the more at risk you are of getting this and you wake up one morning and you're, you're nauseous, you're vomiting and you can't control it. And that's another reason for these admissions. And also, as we've said, the, the psychotic effects, more people are becoming schizophrenic because of this. <coughs> so these are your know, multiple reasons for, for a hospital emergency room visits. And we're seeing more of them. And definitely Colorado <laughs> slow more of them when it went up 147% when this became legalized. Okay, thank you so much. Representative Johnson, you have a question? Hi, hi yes, I just lost audio just in time to hear Kadeem say thank you very much. So thank you, uh, <laughs> uh, muting while driving. Thank you all, I really appreciate the information. I appreciate the deck that you sent Margaret and I'll review it. Uh, when I can in my office this afternoon. Um, again, really appreciate this and all the work you do, uh, especially around the prevention education. I think that's such an important component to this. Um, and I had a question about, well, and first off, just to echo what uh, Kadeem is saying, Representative Roberts, that um, oftentimes we look to say what the UK does with the cigarette warning labels on the cartons. And I think that that model could be potentially quite effective here if we try to get closer to what they do on, on nicotine. But um, I did have a question because I've been concerned ever since, you know, when this came through our council on Norwalk about proximity to schools and how we, because I've done a bit of this prevention education uh, research with alcohol and tobacco, but, um, you know, how we ensure that students aren't seeing uh, dispensaries on their way to school, for example, uh, so long as, you know, because I, I know there's different advertising um, I, at least I assume, but I'd love to know what your thoughts are about um, well, graphics that young people may be exposed to in the community, but also specifically um, storage and how we do education okay. campaigns for adults to safely store cannabis in the home, uh, like you just said, Margaret. What, what are some best practices there that we need to know about? I can speak Margaret, to that. I don't know if you wanted to answer or and or Melissa, since uh, both of you have been uh, chair leaders behind this. Go, so, Melissa. Um, I think we do need to keep assessing whether the law is accurately um, 
prevent um, cannabis from being um, cannabis retailers from being located close to um, places where children gather. And I think there is some discrepancy between local zoning laws and what the cannabis bill, the cannabis law um, allows for advertising. We're already seeing some discussion of that. And that might be a off, you know, another discussion to have with more time. Um, in terms of safe storage, you'll see a lot of our local prevention councils are pivoting our opioid, you know, our prescription drug safe storage message is now expanding to include vapes and edibles and cannabis products. So we do need to do a lot of safe storage um, education to adults, um, especially those, and because not only is it um, dangerous for kids, it's also dangerous for pets. Um, so just keeping those products because, you know, alcohol, people keep in their you know, alcohol cabinets. Um, we find edibles and vapes and things people are keeping in their nightstands or they're keeping in locations that are accessible to kids. So um, big, big lift for the prevention councils. Okay, and wow. uh, last but not least, um, after, uh, um, excuse me, Representative Fahey um, asked her question, we're going to move on with the presentation. I want to make sure that we are sensitive to everyone's time today, and uh, we do have a couple of other um, uh, points that we would like to make um, before we leave. Representative Kristen McCarthy Fahey. Thank you, Jim. Hi, I don't, I don't mean to be so formal with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Well, as Giovanna and Margaret and I have worked together for many years and we will continue that work. Um, I just want to, I guess, just name the fact that I think a lot in the prevention community and certainly I know um, even in our own coalition here in Fairfield, bemoan the fact that cannabis has been legalized here in Connecticut. Um, I think it's important that we move forward from where we are. And one of the things that just specific to what you presented, Margaret, in this section is if we're looking at some of those warning labels, which I think you know are not a bad idea, that we need to have some consensus. And even here today in the chat, there's not consensus the way that we have consensus, for example, around alcohol. There's, there's as my uh, husband's grandmother might say, there's no denying um, with alcohol, whereas with cannabis, there are a lot of folks who will deny some of the things that that you shared today. And so I think that's one of the challenges that we have as we're looking at public health and safety, and particularly as we're helping to educate parents around young people and the very specific and very clear risks for those whose brains are still developing uh, this product is not safe and not legal for those who are under 21. And we in the prevention community know that this product is not best for those whose brains are still developing to 25. So I think that's just naming a challenge and kind of framing the work as we go forward. Thank you. Uh, Representative Mara, if you don't mind, I'm gonna hold your question uh, for a little bit so we can continue to move on into the presentation if you don't mind. Kevin, if you don't mind resharing sure. and the next yeah, presenter. Ahead. All right, can everybody see that? Are we back up? Yes. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Margaret and Dr. Oshman um, for that last, uh, that last section on the public health considerations. And thank you um, for everybody for being here, for our legislators, everyone in attendance. Um, I'm pleased to talk in this next section um, and I'll be joined by Melissa McGarry who is the coordinator for Teapod and Trumbull um, who uh, I will give a shout out is uh, probably one of the more innovative and um, you know, really a, a model prevention council in the state. Uh, and we're also, we're incredibly lucky that she also happens to live in Westport uh, and be a, a Westport parent and a member of our Westport Prevention Coalition. Um, and also Ben Fitzgerald, who's uh, uh, been a fantastic intern um, for us, even just in his short time of a few months, uh, working out of positive directions um, and helping out with a lot of our prevention efforts with the Westport Prevention Coalition. So my name, uh, to introduce myself, I'm Kevin Godburn. I'm the Youth Services Program Director for the Town of Westport. Um, I co-coordinate the Prevention Coalition with Margaret 
Um, and I also manage the, West, the YSB uh, and the JRB for Westport. So here we want to take a few minutes and talk about the impact uh, to youth and families, what we're seeing and consider some prevention opportunities there. Um, so I'll pull up a couple graphs. Um, and as Margaret noted in the last section, uh, unfortunately, as we hear over and over, teens and adults are still largely unaware of many of the health risks that were just mentioned. So I'm gonna, you know, ring the bell a little bit more for you know the need around education um, and you know prevention opportunities and programs. Um, as we deliver, as we deliver the programs to, to our community members, to our, our our adults, our parents, our kids, you know, as you might expect, a, a lot of them are still there. These programs are often met with a fair amount of surprise, um, you know, around the information um, that we share. And our local uh, data, so uh, you can see the two charts on the screen, they're composite data from surveys that were done in uh, Norwalk and Westport uh, back in 2021. So, you know, one of the things we have seen in, from those surveys is that the perception of harm around using marijuana uh, amongst kids is much lower than any other substance. It's lower than alcohol, it's lower than nicotine. Um, or other drugs. Uh, and we also found that the perception of parental disapproval and the perception of peer disapproval for using marijuana is lower than you know other substances. So marijuana in that respect is still is viewed as you know a relatively safer alternative uh, to some other substances, uh, which you know we know not to be the case and, and again to champion the, the need for education and the work in prevention. So some of the things that we, we knew from these surveys is that, uh, you know, if kids knew the risks, you know, they were 10 times less likely to use cannabis. Um, and, you know, as you, some of you that are in the prevention field or have been to prevention meetings, you know, know, you know, parental disapproval um, is a, a big indicator for, uh, you know, substance use or, or not using substances. And we know that, uh, in, in our surveys, kids were seven to eight times less likely to use cannabis you know, if their parents disapproved. Um, you know, the, nice, the nice thing is that we're, we're not the first state to, to legalize. So we do have other data and models to look at as were shared in the public health section. Um, you know, some of you may have seen a, a study that came out in early December. It showed a 245% increase in adolescent cannabis use since the year 2000. Um, and during that time, alcohol trends have declined. So, you know, marijuana, you, cannabis use is going up. Alcohol use is uh, largely going down um, in the nation. And again, I think that kind of speaks to that, that, you know, the need to, for education and the need to catch up with PSAs, with programs, you know, the way we have for nicotine and alcohol. Um, you know, there were studies done for looking at California, looking at Washington, looking at some of these earlier states that legalized, you know, and one of the things that did come out was, you know, going back and in hindsight, the need to be proactive, you know, with the funding for some of these programs, because, you know, as the tax revenue took some time to really fill the coffers, uh, you know, the risks, the, the issues that arise, they don't wait, they're not, you know, they're not taking as much time. Um, so there's, there was that gap between, you know, what was put in place and, you know, what communities, families uh, were, were struggling to deal with. Um, there was also, there was an article from NPR just last week, it was also, it was picked up in ABC News, you know, some other um, uh, sources that cited from the Journal of Pediatrics, and it mentioned the number of states that have legalized cannabis in the last five years, and, and the number of uh, children who e eating edibles that have spiked. So they showed that just under, um, and, and were hospitalized. So they were just over 200 reported cases under six in 2017, and that's jumped to 3,054 in 2021. Uh, which was uh, striking. And I, I can say, uh, if I can take off my youth services hat and put on my parent hat, you know, as a parent of, uh, you know, a seven-year-old and a 12-year-old, um, and especially a seven-year-old with uh, 
a pretty big sweet tooth. I, I will say, you know, the edibles are a scary, a scary thing. Um, you know, it's um, sh sharing, building awareness about smoking, about alcohol, um, you know, comparatively easy. Uh, telling a kid to turn down, um, you know, a gummy bear or, or candy uh, that they're offered or find or someone brings to school um, is, a, is a little bit harder. You know, the conversations that we've been having, but I know it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a challenge and hopefully more as we, as we talk to parents, hopefully it's something that more parents will, um, will do, you know, talk to kids, talk early, talk often. Um, now, I will say that beinthenowct.org is a, a great resource that was launched by the state. And, you know, it's something that we've shared frequently recently, trying to educate parents and give parents tools and resources. Um, but we just have to make sure that that education continues on the state level um, and, and locally where so much of the work is done, you know, with parents and kids. Um, and then, you know, as YSBs and, and JRBs, play an integral role in the community-based diversion system from court. Uh, you know, we also, we have concerns about the legal, what the impact will have on um, additional burdens to the community-based diversion system. Um, you know, the state, you know, we hope and ensures that adequate resources and services are available for that screening, that early intervention, um, the referral and treatment as needed. You know, it, probably comes as no surprise to anybody that the referrals that we continue to see um, are more and more complex, you know, with the mental health, the behavioral health, uh, the social emotional issues that were triggered by the pandemic, that were enhanced by the pandemic. Um, you know, there's just, there's a lot of need there. And for those that self-medicate, uh, you know, it becomes even more complex and adds a layer. So again, that need for community-based prevention and treatment support is, pretty critical. So I, you know, I know law enforcement considerations will be discussed um, in a little bit, but again, just to ring the bell to have support and funding for prevention and education programs. Um, so Preventure, the Johnny's Ambassadors training, uh, the bot then life skills, you know, stuff like that. The cessation treatment options, the American Lung Associations, not program, you know, they all require staff, they all require training. Um, and you know, we know that that's going to be a strain on you know some communities, you know, especially those that you know don't have the benefit of having you know YSBs or JRBs in place to handle some of this stuff. Um, so, continuing to talk about you know education and awareness and the need, I do want to turn it over to Ben Fitzgerald, who's going to talk a little bit um, about an environmental scan that was done through the Prevention Coalition um, and speak to the, the need for education around retail with retailers as well. Hi hey everyone. Uh, once again, I did want to say a big thank you to the legislators who took time out of their day to be on call today. Uh, as Kevin said, my name is Ben Fitzgerald. I'm an AmeriCorps member serving with Positive Directions in the Norwalk Partnership. And it was me and another coworker who were responsible for doing an environmental scan of six Westport locations that sold either CBD products or nicotine products. We were both 19 when we conducted this environmental scan, so we weren't of age to purchase nicotine or any kind of THC products. Uh, THC was also illegal for recreational sale at the time of this purchase, and it's still illegal to be purchased in Westport by town ordinance. Despite this fact, half the stores that we went to, three out of six, were illegally selling THC products. And an additional half of these stores did not cart teenagers. In fact, the stores that we went to that sold THC were pretty eager to recommend THC products to us when we didn't ask for them. Um, so Kevin, if you could just click the slideshow really quickly. Thank you. So we were able to purchase Delta 9 THC gummies, so full on edibles at a yoga wellness shop in Westport, which is the last place where you'd expect to get them. But I didn't even ask for these gummies. I asked for Delta 8, which is a less potent version of THC. I asked for Delta 8 and they just pulled uh, a pack of full on edibles from beneath their counter. Um, additionally, I went to another smoke shop. I just asked for a vape and the guy behind the counter recommended me a THC vape. He recommended me edibles and he recommended me other THC products. So when we're talking about access, the access is definitely there for youth who 
are interested in trying cannabis products. And obviously this is going to impact the decision to start using marijuana. Good morning, everyone. I wanna thank the legislators um, for joining us today and Kevin and Ben um, for presenting on the other uh, prevention consequences. Um, I wanted to just touch base on some of the disconnect between um, the penalties for alcohol possession and the penalties for cannabis possession um, by youth in, in our laws. And um, just to kind of explain, um, as it's no surprise, um, penalties certainly communicate to kids what we perceive as um, risk. So um, looking at the possession consequences for alcohol, there is an option for a juvenile summons or referral to a juvenile review board, a JRB. A JRB is a community uh, panel who looks at um, restoration and support and resources to a youth and family who have been um, caught in the, you know, the criminal justice system. Um, so you see a juvenile summons is an option for possession of alcohol. You also see that there's a um, Department of Motor Vehicles penalty. So young people either have to wait to get a driver's license or get their driver's license suspended if they're um, caught with any possession of alcohol. With um, cannabis, we see a different approach. Um, first uh, penalty for first possession is a written warning. Um, there is no central database of those written warnings, so it's possible for a um, young person to get multiple written warnings in different communities. There's no coordination between towns. There's an optional referral to a JRB. Um, as Kevin mentioned, not every town in Connecticut has a juvenile review board, has a JRB, so um, the law doesn't address um, what a, a police department would do with um, a young person who um, is in one of those communities. There's no impact on the driver's license. There's also, um, there's the JR, the juvenile review boards or the youth service bureaus. Um, they work on kind of a stick and carrot approach. So um, with many of the, the crimes that might uh, cause a referral. Um, if the family or the young person don't cooperate, there's kind of an alternative consequence of going back to the courts. With cannabis, no such thing really exists. So, um, you know, many are, many communities are finding it harder to engage these families because there is no kind of alternative. So um, we're not really able to um, really intercede and intervene and um, kind of stop the problem when we first identify it. You'll notice at age 18 and up, um, the fine is significantly less than um, the fine for possessing alcohol. Um, there's a health warning that, uh, there's actually a health warning that um, is also required, but um, the state hasn't really communicated that very effectively in some of their communication to the police department. So, you know, just to highlight this disconnect between the, the penalties, you know, none of us really want, um, we're all believers in restorative practices with young people, but, um, it, it certainly highlights to kids that maybe we consider cannabis possession less serious than alcohol possession. So we just wanted to highlight that to the legislators. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Melissa and Ben. And uh, just to um, piggyback on what you know, Melissa said, just from that engagement perspective, you know, with the kids, and again, um, you know, to uh, to ring the bell for uh, prevention work programs and education, you know, persistence um, and, and options are really the biggest tools that we have to work with, you know, persistence and, and meaning you know, time um, and, and and the opportunities, so the programs, you know, with, with working with these families. So, you know, we'll get kids in with referrals where we'll be able to take them from A to B um, and, and find success, you know, maybe that, that one referral, that one program, and it, it just happens to work, it clicks for that kid, it works for that family. But there are others where, you know, we're, we may go A to Z before we find somebody that works, sorry, something, something that works. A referral, a program, you know, something that catches and helps it out. So really the, the, the larger toolkit, the, the more opportunities, the more options that we have um, really across y, YSBs, across programs, across um, the state, the organizations, the, the people that are working with youth and families, uh, really the better. So, um, you know, uh, the policy, the, the call to action. Um, so again, we just, we, we ask that if anybody is um, willing to support just investing in that prevention work, you know, addressing the issues, the education, the access, treatment and consequences, um, 
but also as, as Melissa just touched on, you know, aligning those consequences for underage cannabis possession with the alcohol penalties um, so that we do send a consistent message uh, that, you know, these substances are dangerous. I'll, I'll go ahead and stop my share here. First, I just want to um, just point out time. It is 9.32 and I know um, that we said we were going to try and get everyone um, to speak by this time and I know it's past then. Um, but I hope that uh, to all the legislators, we're, we're intriguing you enough to stay, stay <laughs> with us just for a little bit longer. Um, we will, um, Coming up, we have law enforcement talking about considerations and then also funding considerations. So uh, two definitely important topics uh, just to add to your information and knowledge. Uh, so, um, and, and so what I'd like to do is any re representatives have questions related to the, the last um, youth prevention considerations? I know Representative Mara you had a question before, if you're still online. Um, yeah, thank you. I am still here. And I, I'm i so sorry for coming on late. Hopefully I can get the video. I was stuck in my car and trying to figure out um, Zoom in the car and it didn't work. Um, my question for you is, and you may have already covered it, how have these studies with secondhand smoke been recently since the concentrations of a lot of the products have increased in their potency. Do we? Do you know if we have updated information on um, the effects of secondhand smoke? Thanks. I'm going to look to Margaret or um, Dr. Ashman. So I haven't seen any real studies, controlled clinical trials where people are, are asked to just take in what's in the environment. But um, I would assume that yes, if you're with someone in a room and it's heavily, uh, it heavily contains a lot of smoke from marijuana, you, you will take some in. Whether that has the same effect as someone who's actually doing the vaping or smoking, um, I, I really don't know. I couldn't, I couldn't uh, answer that right now, but I would say that if you're vaping, you can actually take in at least 800 milligrams of, of marijuana in, in vaping. So that's very high and um, it has a quick effect and, and a, a psychological effect. Whether someone sitting next to you while you're vaping will have that same impact uh, from the uh, THC, I don't think there are any studies at the moment that um, I can address uh, this issue with. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, for, for all of my speakers, I know there are a couple of questions that are coming from other um, attendees here. If you don't mind just answering uh, those questions in the chat box so that then it'll uh, move a little quicker and we can continue with the presentations. There's no other questions. I'll have uh, Kevin share again and have Lieutenant Prezioso. Did I say that properly? As an Italian, as a Python, you know, I, I hope I did. That was, that was very impressive. Yes, that is the correct pronunciation. So thank you. Yay! <laughs> I did live in Italy for two years, but it's all good. <laughs> I'm proud of myself. And Detective Ashley Del Vecchio will be presenting, as well as Sergeant Sofia Gulino. Hi. Please. Well, I will lead it off. Um, just wanted to definitely take a moment to thank everyone. I know your time is very valuable, and obviously, this is a very important topic. So, very from the bottom of my heart, thank you all for being here. Um, I, I, I just have a few points that I would like to make. I will try to cut things down. Um, from what I originally planned to present just for the purposes of time. Um, one of the first things I definitely want to highlight uh, once again, and I feel like we have sort of belabored the point, but um, Melissa's piece was, was very, very important in that I feel there are some very, very serious inconsistencies in the penalties um, for underage possession of marijuana versus alcohol. 
Um, again, you know, echoing her sentiments, it sends a very, very bad message. I think our goal really should be um, responsible use and obviously keeping children safe. I can only speak for our department, but I'm sure there's plenty of other stories out there from other agencies. Uh, we've already had a couple incidents with this stuff falling into the wrong hands and having some adverse effects. Um, so really that should be our number one goal is, is, is to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, obviously we're looking for responsible use um, and we, we would sort of hope that responsible use is sort of something that's reflected by uh, the way the law is written at this point. Um, unfortunately, I do feel like that some of the language of the law does present um, some difficulties in enforcement. Um, we recently received, it went out to the chiefs of police, a law enforcement bulletin from the Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, it, it covered some of the changes as they relate to uh, impaired driving and changes in forms and things that we need to complete when we suspect someone of impaired driving to kind of incorporate cannabis. Um, at the end of this bulletin, there were a lot of these open-ended scenarios, which again, time permitting, I would have read one or two um, open-ended scenarios in the sense that they were, they were questions pretty much posed that how, how could law enforcement handle something like this? Um, thankfully, one of our local state's attorneys actually took the time to answer some of these, these scenarios and essentially what they were saying consistently um, is that there is a lot of prohibitive language that seems to prevent us from properly enforcing, uh, especially impaired driving. It's definitely one of the things that I would like to focus on. Um, I think one of the first problems is a lot of the penalties related to possession, if in fact you are reaching these possession limits, um, those are all based on weights. And it is very difficult to um, measure weights, obviously, by eye. It's very difficult to know if someone is in possession of more, unless it's blatantly obvious, more than the recommended or allowed amounts. Um, you have language that pretty much is saying, look, you're, you're, you're not allowed to search a vehicle based on the presence or odor of marijuana, which is understandable. But again, if you can't put your hands on the product, how can you ever know that someone is in possession of more than they should be in possession of? Um, beyond that, the police accountability bill also limited our ability to really make a determination on these things because now we're not allowed to ask for consent to search. So even in a situation where I suspected that you were carrying more than you should, um, again, unless it was a plain view situation where literally the entire backseat is filled with marijuana, um, it's very, very difficult for me to actually get into that car and realize if, you know, try to determine whether or not you're, you're, you're in violation in some way. Um, I think even, you know, more concerning than that um, is a lot of these scenarios detailed the various different situations where you have an operator driving down the street and either they are smoking, there is the odor of marijuana coming from the car, you have a passenger smoking, you have someone holding a glass pipe to their, you know, to their mouth, to their face, and you, you, you a reasonable person can determine that, yes, these people are actively smoking marijuana. Within this legislation, there is a piece that pretty much says that, yeah, that, that, that would be impaired driving and that that is against the law. However, there is complicated language within the statute that pretty much does not allow us to uh, make a motor vehicle stop solely because of that reason. Um, I can certainly tell you that even in my private life at this point, uh, I have definitely been driving down the street. You get the odor of marijuana from the car in front of you. You can see the operator is clearly smoking marijuana. And to me, that's a situation where if, if, that's, if that's being viewed by law enforcement in their official capacity, we, we should probably be able to do something about that. But the reality is, is that we would have to then look for um, further signs that there's actually impaired driving. And the simple fact is that smoking marijuana as a passenger or as a, um, as a driver is, is, is against the law. So why wouldn't we take action on that? Um, another thing that I would definitely point out, and I think it's... Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a nod to, to Ben's portion of the presentation. I think there's going to be, especially now that we're moving into the recreational sales, I think there's going to be a lot of difficulty in the, the regulation of both legitimate and illegitimate sellers of these various different products. Um, I definitely think as, as the availability is more widespread um, and, and access is out there, it's going to be very, very tough for the police department if, if we are, you know, we're, we're just partnering with, with even state agency to try and, and monitor this. Um, it's going to be very, very tough. Um, I know the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services is, is willing to come out and do compliance checks. We've actually already been in talks with them based on the uh, environmental scan that was done by Ben. Um, we're, we're anticipating they should be out here within the next week or two to start actually taking a look at some of these local smoke shops um, and, and, and see what it is that can be done. Um, one thing I would also highlight 
the, uh, the Connecticut Forensic Science Laboratory. Uh, this is something actually I just learned myself. So as I mentioned, we had a couple of cases involving uh, you know, some cannabis products falling into the wrong hands. And um, in follow-up with the, with the Forensic Science Laboratory, they, they pretty much said, look, we can tell you what is in uh, a product. If you provide us with, you know, say a, an, an edible or something like that, we can tell you, okay, there, we can confirm the presence of THC. Um, we can confirm any other, you know, um, materials that might be in there, but we cannot determine what the potency of it is. Um, so you, you, you've got sales limits on potency of products, which, which sounds good on paper, but how would we ever be able to determine, at least officially, um, that those products are outside of the boundaries of what is allowed by law? Um, and the last thing that I would just really highlight is the Drug Recognition Expert Program. Um, I think at the time of passage of this law, I think we, it was really, um, there weren't enough drug recognition experts throughout the state really to handle what would be a, a massive uptick in potentially impaired driving um, by people under the influence of marijuana. Um, I can tell you that that is a very complex training. It's a two-part training. There's actually a prerequisite course that you have to take and successfully complete. And then you can move on to the, the drug recognition expert portion, um, which is also a very long uh, class that also happens in two parts. Um, there's a very high failure rate there uh, for obvious reasons, because we only want the most qualified people who are able to testify on this, ultimately becoming drug recognition experts. But you know, we as the Westport Police Department, and I can only speak for us, only recently certified uh, one person on this at this point. But you know, again, we have one officer He's not working 24 hours a day, um, so you have a need to really draw from resources from other places. For whatever reason, I believe Fairfield County was sort of underrepresented in having enough drug recognition experts out there. Um, so that 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 that's it, it makes enforcement very very difficult. Um, defense attorneys that are representing people for DUI have gotten very very good at doing that and pointing out loopholes and things. And I think with the way some of the legislation is written right now, um, they, they, it will be very difficult to prosecute these cases. Um, and, I, and I guess the, the just sort of, you know, wrap it all up, really, um, the, the cost of, of obviously training and enforcement is, is high, um, you know, so we, we certainly would hope as police departments that there would be funding made available for this. I think it's something that should be a priority, especially now with, you know, with the, with the recreational sales going live. Um, so I, I do think, I guess, just to put a ball on it, you know, there's an opportunity here to sort of um, reexamine some of the penalties um, as well as the, the language of the law, you know, to really allow for proper enforcement with the obvious goal being, you know, responsible use by adults. So um, I, I, I went on a bit there. If, if, if my, uh, my two colleagues would like to add anything, by all means, feel free. Again, thank you very much for your time this morning. Hi, I'm Detective Ashley Del Vecchio. Um, I'm the youth detective for Westport Police Department. I also work closely with Kevin Godburn and Margaret the Prevention Coalition. Um, thank you all for being here. I don't want to take up any more time. Of course, um, Lieutenant Prezioso and I discussed what we we're going to talk about today, and he hit on all those points. Um, some things I just wanted to highlight, like in my position as the youth detective, is how um, you know the communities really need to come together on this because if we enforce or meet with um, these places selling in Westport, that doesn't mean our youth aren't going to other communities in our area to try and purchase them. Um, so it really takes like the state effort here and just working with kids, they don't, a lot of kids are unaware that you need to be 21. So they're, they're like, well, it's legal now in the state. So that's a lot of feedback I'm getting. Um, and I just wanted to share that with all of you and thank you very much again for being here today. Sergeant Galino, would you like to add anything? Javon, I don't think she's here at the moment. All right. Detective Del Vecchio or Lieutenant, would you like to go through your call to action? Yeah, I, I think we we touched upon most of these points already. Um, I think the slide just reinforces some of the things that I was I was mentioning earlier. So pretty much uh, might be redundant at this point. 
So for the legislators, the type of policies, um, I, I only am gonna say this out loud because a lot of them are on their phones and they have no video, so they can't see anything at this time. So auditory is definitely um, better. So for the legislators, what types of policies would you be willing to support? Allow police to stop drivers suspected of impaired driving to access safety? Specify penalties to retailers for underage sales? Increase funding to police to support compliance checks and enhance enforcement efforts. And the last one is develop pro protocols for ensuring compliance on advertising. Kevin, if you don't mind, thank you. <laughs> Do we have any questions from our uh, state representatives? Okay. Kristen, I see your uh, representative McCarthy Vahey. I see your hand is up. Uh, did you have a question or was that from before? Yvonne, my apologies. I think I must have never lowered my hand. No but worries. I just want to say that this is, uh, though I co chair uh, public health, I've been a member of the Transportation Committee for many years. <laughs> and these are absolutely issues that I want to continue to engage in conversation around as well. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the uh, last uh, on our agenda, which is funding considerations. Okay, and that is me, I'm up. So um, as, as we hear everyone today, um, the struggles, the the considerations of what the cannabis bill uh, lacks. Um, I'm gonna talk about funding. We need funding for prevention efforts. I can't say that enough. I probably should just say that and repeat it through the entire uh, presentation. But um, really in 2018, the prevention infrastructure changed, reducing organizations to focus on, um, on behavioral health uh, topics. The regional behavioral health boards, um, behavioral health action organizations are funded solely through federal grant dollars um, that are administered by uh, DEMAS and DCF. Those grants require deliverables that are critical to community oriented initiatives, but do not provide for essential capacity building and general prevention work. Um, there is a local prevention council in every city town in Connecticut who receives prevention dollars based on their population. Since 2020, Connecticut has gained new residents from other states, but that's not reflected in our current census data. If an LPC, Local Prevention Council, can't receive or get any other source of income, the amount of the um, the amount that they would receive is on the second bullet in this um, in this presentation. Which, for the uh, representatives, uh, LPC grants can go can range from two thousand two hundred and seventy six dollars to ten thousand three hundred and fifty seven dollars which is not a lot of money um, for prevention efforts when you think about all of um, the things that are happening within our communities, vaping, mental health, suicide, cannabis, um, cocaine, all of these um, substances that arise in, in our communities, communities on a daily basis. Um, in Westport, the Human Services uh, Department does provide some uh, limited additional funding to the coalition, which is great. And in Norwalk and Fairfield, Positive Directions received a CDC drug-free communities grant for $125,000 per year for five years. Um, after 10 years, that grant cannot be renewed. So we talk about sustainability as well, um, especially for um, those that do have drug-free community grants. It's really important. It's really important to make sure that we instill and sustain the work that all of our prevention, um, all of our preve prevention people are doing within their communities. The current funding for LPCs is focused on contractual deliverables that doesn't allow them to focus on other specific town priorities. 
Currently, DEMAS, uh, DEMAS's priority is to reduce vaping amongst 12 to 18 year olds. Some LPC funds can be used towards cannabis as long as the LPC can prove that it is related to vaping uh, with data. And now data is, is hard because not every community has data to, um, to compile and, and read. Um, every two years, the RBHEOs have to write a priority needs report for each, for each DEMAS region. Cannabis has ranked within the top five priority substances throughout our state. For our region, cannabis ranked number four in our priority report in 2020, whereas vaping ranked number five. Vaping was never a top priority. Even though we are expecting cannabis to continue to rank highly, vaping will most likely continue to be the LPC priority substance until 2025. But we do hope that we can, we can advocate and change that um, with uh, Demas. As uh, Kevin mentioned, uh, we do, uh, Demas <coughs> does have a, um, a website called Be In The No CT. And yes, it is regarding the cannabis law. And yes, it's a great resource. And yes, it talks a lot about how parents can, uh, you know, uh, learn more about it. Uh, however, it does not address the issues that we are raising here today. Thank you. Next slide, please. Hello everyone, Caitlin Comet, The Hub. Thank you legislators for joining us and sticking with us. We are right at the end here. I'm already a fast talker, so I feel the pressure. So I apologize in advance. This chart here details the current funding plans for state retail cannabis tax revenue distribution and is broken down into four different accounts um, as well as fiscal years. The current funding plans for state retail uh, tax revenue distribution, it's a mouthful. Um, I'm going to focus on two here just for the sake of time. Firstly, the Social Equity and Innovation Fund. The Social Equity Council was developed as part of the bill to ensure that adult use cannabis programs are equitable and ensure that funds are brought back to the communities that were most disproportionately uh, impacted by the war of drugs. So funds here will be used for different initiatives, including access for business capital, technical assistance for business startups and operation, workforce education, and community investments, as you can see detailed here in the chart. The Prevention and Recovery Services Fund. So at the earliest, these funds will support our efforts, um, but will not start until fiscal year 24, or likely later than that. This account will receive 25% of revenue sales, and these portions of the revenue obtained from the retail sales of cannabis will then be directed to four different areas. As you can see here, substance use prevention, treatment, recovery, and data collection and analysis. Um, Kevin has mentioned, Giovanna has mentioned that uh, Connecticut health agencies, including DPH, DMIS, uh, DCF, are launching new programs and initiatives regarding prevention, treatment, and recovery to cannabis. So we are speaking about funding supports for our behavioral health work. As you can see throughout the pre, uh, presentation, there is a need for this, as this is already happening and rising in our communities. And you can also see, just looking at this chart, there are many challenges that we are facing with the current funding plan. Talking about tax revenue, and this was uh, already mentioned, but I'll just briefly uh, restate it. At certain towns like Norwalk that do allow cannabis sales, there can be an added 3% municipal tax on such sales. Um, and those specific tax funds can be used for six different areas, none of which in which prevention is identified among these. Um, the closest that we may have is community services. Um, it was also mentioned that the JRBs and YSBs um, can be funded with these funds, but not all towns have one, um, have these supports. Um, and it is, again, only for the towns that have that uh, municipal 3% uh, tax. Um, so what it would look like is revenue would be the Connecticut sales tax plus tax based on THC content, which we already heard there is a, a, it's a there's a lot of discrepancies and it's not particularly being regulated. Um, and then the 3% to two municipalities. So to call to your attention to what we see as challenges with this current funding plan. 
So firstly, it's pretty obvious, but the Prevention and Recovery Services Fund does not start until at the earliest fiscal year 24 to 26, and that's certainly sometime after the start of cannabis sales, which began two days ago. Um, and because those retail sales have already been pushed back, um, that may mean that prevention funds will also be pushed back. Um, so you can imagine after everything that my fellow presenters spoke about today, we need additional prevention funds starting now. Um, Giovanna spoke to you about our current funding support, and it's just not enough to sustain this work, um, especially when a, a huge focus of our efforts are for our youth, for those under 21, for those in whose their, their brain development is still happening until the age of 25. Um, so it is especially challenging waiting for another two years or potentially longer. Um, also, at, to point out, again, we'll only receive 25% um, of the funds, and that is to be dispersed between those four different areas. So that's four different types of services needed for training, four different areas with employees needed, time, and more. Um, and you can imagine with these areas that are already <laughs> underfunded, those funds will come in and will quickly dissipate. Um, and especially where we really want to talk about covering the state level, the regional levels, but also the local levels. It's really the local efforts that we're, we really want to get into the community. So we really suspect what's going to be left for these local level efforts. Um, <laughs> The bill also covers within the prevention and recovery services, the language is substance abuse prevention, <laughs> treatment and recovery. There is no mention of behavioral health or mental health and substance use misuse together. So that just further divides the care that's needed for both substance use and mental health when substance use disorder treatment usually involves addressing mental health and should address mental health. As you also learned from our presenters earlier, and I'll call your attention to Dr. Um, Ulschman's section, um, today's high potency cannabis exasperates or even creates new mental illnesses, um, including anxiety, psychosis, and suicidality. And we are seeing a spike in treatment admissions with the specificity of uh, cannabis. So these two things really go together. This is a behavioral health public, public health issue. Um, one thing we also want to learn more about, and we ask you um, for further clarification, is that Social Equity and Innovation Fund, as you can see, that fund is going to receive up to 75% of the revenue um, funds. And we would like to better understand the rationale for that percentage. Um, you know, we had a, a community member take a look at this chart and really didn't understand, you know, what was happening there. Um, and as you can see, we're just gonna get that steady 25%. Um, so we really wanna understand how that's going to work when the Social Equity Innovation Fund is essentially making money off of those cannabis sales. They are giving the, the tax revenue just to receive that right back. Um, so yeah, we would like to further understand that. Some additional points, and this is my final points here. The language of the bill is, is complicated, especially when it comes to the funding, um, as, what, as has been mentioned earlier. Um, it's a very lengthy bill as well. There's a lot of need for clarification, especially in the regulation of those funds and the many prior challenges that were mentioned today. Um, who's going to be doing that work? Who needs support to do that work? And then just as we're on the topic to further that point that law enforcement is also currently underfunded for the additional responsibilities and initiatives that are going to come with this bill. There is currently no plans for funding support for law enforcement, despite, as you heard, the additional need for that proactive compliance and enforcement in response to cannabis legalization. So for the sake of time, um, I guess I'll, I'll stop talking here, but our asks were pretty much everything that we have covered so far. Thank you for your time um, uh, in sticking with us on this very early a uh, gloomy morning. Um, thank you for your time for allowing me to speak as well. Thank you, Caitlin. Any representatives that have questions? I know a couple of them had to jump off uh, for another meeting, but um, we will send them the recording and uh, info brief um, as well. If not, I'm going to pass it over to Margaret um, for final uh, words. Thanks, Giovanna. Everyone, um, it's, this has been a really great um, opportunity to showcase the different partnerships, the different sectors um, and stakeholders that are involved in this work and concerned about it. Uh, I hope everyone was taking a look at the chat too, where more discussion was taking place. 
Um, I, I hope your takeaway today is we're looking at how do we do this responsibly, this adult use of marijuana responsibly in the state. And there are places where we really are asking our legislators to increase funding, close loopholes, um, and promote education and awareness in ways that are not built into the law, where we can really learn from examples from alcohol, um, nicotine, other states. So uh, we will send all the documents and slideshow and recording link to everyone who's registered. Um, but, you know, it's 10. We've been here an hour and a half, which is what our presenters were available for. I don't know if we have any legislators left, but what I'd really like to ask to close out here is legislators. Anybody ready to say, I'm gonna introduce legislation on one of these topics? Let us know what you're gonna do here. It's our call to action. Who's going to take the, the baton? Um, and if you want more discussion around any of this, throw it in the chat. There are a lot of people here today who didn't get a chance to talk and have plenty to tell you. But we'd like a final word from some legislators, please. I see Jonathan. Well, that was intentional. <laughs> uh, obviously, this was extremely valuable for all of us, even those of us who were relatively close to the bill when it was originally imagined a year ago. And Margaret and I spent a lot of time talking about things we could do to clarify and improve. <laughs> but it's evident that more work needs to be done. And I'm particularly concerned about the vagaries of the funding. Uh, I, I, I know it's hard to change funding as the program has only started. So there's no way to really measure whether or not it is being allocated appropriately. Uh, it may be a lot to ask to change it in this session, but at least in terms of clarifying some things to make the local neighborhood agencies eligible for some of that funding, I think that we can do that. So if you'd like to share language, I'd be glad to see if uh, we can get that inserted into the conversation. Fantastic. Thank you, Jonathan. We can do that. Anyone else? I see Kristen still with us. Kristen, I feel like some of the, you know, health ed warning label stuff could come straight out of your committee. Okay. Margaret, I I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. I apologize. Yeah. I had to pause to safely unmute. And I I'm in transit. You I as you and I had communicated previously, we will definitely be talking about a number of these items. I think Jonathan's observations are very astute. Um, I think there's some education that we can help you all with in terms of information about the role of the social equity council and what those funds will be used for that's certainly something that we can, can talk about um, in terms of my reference earlier the, the warning label um, we i have been in along with jonathan and a number of other legislators instrumental in pushing for a higher percentage of those funds to go to the dollars I think Caitlin's point about assuring and clarifying that we are looking at behavioral and mental health support along with substance uh, use, this use to go along with the treatment, intervention, et cetera, uh, prevention is all really important. So we're going to keep talking about all of this. Um, I am committed. And again, a reminder to every <laughs> young person and parent that this Thank you so much for that, Kristen. That's great, and we'll stay in touch. Um, if there are any legislators left here, um, I know everyone's literally arriving in Hartford and jumping into meetings, but I think I saw someone here. Any final words from legislators? And if not, we'll give you your rest of your day back, but thank you all so much for being here. No one else, right? I don't see anybody. Um, so everyone who didn't get a chance to talk or didn't put something in the chat, you are seen, you're recognized. Thank you so much for your support. We know you work with your local prevention coalitions, you're concerned. We, it's all of us in partnership together that make things happen. So thank you all for your efforts, particularly thank you to the presenters and um, be on the lookout for these documents to come to you via email. Thanks everybody. Thank you everybody.
Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Have a good one. <laughs> Margaret, I wanted to tell you something.